Greetings from Jerusalem. Welcome to this special ICJ webinar. And thank you for taking the time to join us. This is a special session which uh, is organized together with the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Hague Initiative for International Cooperation from The Hague, the Netherlands. Uh, we are going to speak today about the recent decision of the International Criminal Court, which could possibly open the way and allow possible war crimes probe against Israel. Even though the decision at hand is an answer by the pre-trial chamber to a procedural question regarding jurisdiction, which was brought forth by the special prosecutor, uh, and this decision does not automatically imply the opening of an investigation against Israel. Uh, nevertheless, we consider this decision outrageous, and we believe it calls for a reaction. And uh, this is why we decided to hold this seminar, and this is the first of a two-part uh, webinars devoted to this matter. The second one will be held in exactly one week from now, on Thursday the 25th, at the same time, 5 p.m. Israel time. And today we will explain the importance of the issue and provide some background information about the role and the powers of the International Criminal Court. And of course, we will hear Israel's assessment of the situation, how dangerous it is potentially to the state of Israel. And our intention is together to consider possible avenues of action. And based on the results of today's discussions, we're going to come up with some specific proposals next week. So please be sure to join us again next Thursday. Today we have three speakers. Each will give about a 15 minute presentation, and then we will open the floor to questions and comments. Uh, we have several distinguished panelists among us. Uh, they can be seen on the screen and they will have the priority uh, in expressing the comments. Then, in addition, anyone from our international audience, and I'd like to welcome you all. We have about 80 people who registered for this webinar. So all of you can ask a question by simply writing in the chat. Subject to time limitations, we'll try to give the floor to everyone. So without uh, much further ado, I'll give the floor to the first speaker, who is my colleague at the International Christian Embassy, Vice President and Senior Spokesman, David Parsons. David is a lawyer by profession who's been following current events in Israel for decades. He is also a writer and a Middle East specialist, and also one of the co-authors of the US Congress Jerusalem Embassy Act, which was passed way back in 1995. It provided for the relocation of the US Embassy to Jerusalem, which finally happened as we saw under the administration of President Trump. So David, uh, please uh, start and explain to us uh, what this decision and the uh, ramifications are all about. Thank you, Mormir. I, I want to give a little context and, and background uh, to this recent ruling by the International Criminal Court uh, why uh, not only Israel, but all her uh, supporters around the world, so she has Christian supporters, should take this seriously uh, and then allow uh, the professionals who deal in international law every day, uh, I'll meet Huyman from the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Andrew Tucker from Think in The Hague uh, to um, uh, you know, uh, build on the uh, background and knowledge we we need to in order to fight this but the Christian Embassy has been monitoring this over recent years and looking at this ruling we decided to really come out uh, using our uh, international network and working with other friendly organizations respected organizations to oppose the uh, International Criminal Court's recent ruling to unlawfully extend its jurisdiction so that a war, war crimes probe could be launched against Israel. We see this as a highly selective and biased move, which has stretched international law beyond recognition and even open up the court to justifiable accusations of anti-Semitism, as was recently suggested by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in his response to the ruling. 
And we can first say that this is ruling is absurd on its face. The jurisdiction of the international court, as we'll learn from our uh, the experts here, uh, it is a court of last resort. It is somewhat consensual. And if you're not a member of the state, you're not supposed to, uh, and you also have serious proactive judicial mechanisms in your own country that deal with some of these crimes that are being mentioned, then you shouldn't be bothered by it. And Israel is not a member of the Rome statute that governs the, uh, the ICC. And it does have a very active uh, and respected judicial uh, system. Uh, including in the military to deal with uh, some of the crimes they want to look at, or alleged crimes, should I say. In addition, the Palestinians do not qualify as a sovereign state under the Rome Statute governing the court, and therefore the court had no legal standing or authority to uh, investigate and charge Israel with war crimes in the so-called occupied territories. And I think what we're witnessing is an overzealous chief prosecutor uh, bending international law to empower her uh, quest to indict Israelis on uh, invalid and unsustainable charges. Uh, we'll look at uh, this in just a minute. She's been working on this uh, for a while. Uh, it's uh, fortunate that she's going to have to step down in June. Her nine-year term is over. But when we look at this, the reason it's so biased, the ICC is overlooking daily war crimes being committed by other brutal regimes, such as Iran and Syria, uh, against their own people. And instead, the ICC uh, is seeking to prosecute Jews for building balconies on their homes in East Jerusalem as if they were Nazi war criminals. This is why it's so outrageous and something that we really want to step up our actions against it. Uh, this ruling did not happen overnight. I believe it's part of a wider diplomatic, uh, Palestinian diplomatic agenda that has been building since the 2001 Durban conference to delegitimize and dismantle Israel. And in terms of the ICC, it has been building for five or six years uh, during the term of this chief prosecutor, Fatou uh, bin Souda. And uh, we'll look at this timeline in just a minute. Uh, but it does reflect the access and influence which uh, the Palestinians and their global allies have in United Nations organs. Uh, and sadly, uh, they have a large effective network of pro-Palestinian NGOs and human rights groups, which constantly pressure these UN bodies to take actions against Israel. And uh, we, I'd have to add with regret that this network is often funded in large part by other member states, like the European Union puts a lot of funding into some of these groups that are constantly agitating against Israel. And the ICC ruling represents a significant advance on three uh, key prongs of this Palestinian agenda since Durban. And I'll share my screen here uh, so that uh, we can look at these one by one very quickly. Okay, first, uh, they have been seeking to gain recognition of a Palestinian state outside of direct bilateral talks with Israel. We've seen this over and over again, going to the General Assembly for statehood. It requires approval by the Security Council, so they've tried there. That was blocked, uh, and but they've been able to get observer status and a lot of UN organs, even recognition as, a, uh, as having a state in some of these UN forums. And now, uh, according to this pretrial ruling by this three judge panel at the International Criminal Court, they do see that there is a Palestinian state in what they call the 1967 territories that would be Gaza, West Bank and East Jerusalem. And therefore it's another significant advance in the Palestinian bid to bypass Israel in gaining a universal recognition of a Palestinian state without having to make compromise, the compromises with Israel needed for peace. Number two, they seek to undermine Israel's legitimacy 
and in particular, its right of self-defense. This was one of the key agendas coming out of uh, Durban, the whole delegitimization, uh, demonization, and dismantling of Israel, as some called it, the three Ds. But we've seen uh, a specific fight to try and strip Israel of its right of self-defense. And uh, this uh, um, move in the International Criminal Court would even allow the international community now to go back and look, especially at what happened in the Gaza conflict in 2014. It was the third uh, Gaza rocket war. I imagine they would wind up looking at all three uh, of the rocket wars in what, 2009, 11, and 14. Uh, also the march, uh, uh, what they called the March of Return, which were really violent protests along the uh, uh, Israel-Gaza border in 2018. And uh, the, they're wanting to uh, identify and try um, Israeli leaders, political leaders and military leaders uh, on charges of war crimes, crimes against humanity in these incidents. There's also a certain peg about Palestinian prisoners uh, that is in, involved in this. But once again, it's, it's part of an agenda that if Israel is not legitimate, then they do not have a right to defend themselves. And this is all a battle of trying to strip Israel of the right to, to uh, defend themselves against rockets, against terror tunnels, against terror attacks, against any means of attacking it. And third, uh, the Palestinians are seeking to uproot the Israeli communities in Judea, Samaria, and we have to add East Jerusalem to this by discrediting them, delegitimizing them, and now even criminalizing settlement activity. And uh, of course, uh, there has been slow incremental progress in this and other UN organs. One of the most serious uh, milestones in this effort, uh, the dark milestone, the UN Security Council Resolution 2334 uh, in December of 2017, as the Obama administration was leaving office, they uh, not only refused to uh, cast a veto against this resolution, but were, uh, there's credible reports that they helped uh, arrange it. But this is a, a very bitter resolution against Israel that uh, uh, decreed that the Israeli settlement uh, activity is a flagrant violation of international criminal law and what the ICC, at least this chief prosecutor, is, is uh, trying to do is to turn settlement activity into a criminal activity, to actually say it's a war crime, uh, similar to what, uh, you know, this is this is part of the uh, Geneva Conventions, were, which were enacted after the uh, Second World War and after the Holocaust. And they were these conventions on warfare were trying to aim at some of the atrocities uh, committed by the, uh, the Nazis, particularly against the Jews, including the mass forced uh, transport or transfer of populations in and out of an occupied territory. And, uh, and this was declared a war crime, a crime against humanity. Uh, uh, afterwards, part of the Geneva Conventions, it's banned under it. And what they're trying to say is that the Jews moving into the biblical heartland of, uh, of the Jewish homeland here in Israel, including in Jerusalem, uh, that uh, this is not only a violation of international law, it is a crime that if someone in East Jerusalem wants to build a balcony on their home, a Jewish person, they are committing a, a war crime as if they were Hitler. Uh, and this is outrageous to us and we want to really uh, come against it uh, with all the moral authority that we can. And when I speak about the 
timeline of uh, how we got to this point and how the Palestinians, how it's part of an agenda that's been with us for about two decades now. The Palestinians have been working on the international court uh, during this time, and they've had some good progress with this chief prosecutor, Fatou Ben Souda, during her term. And uh, they first managed to convince her in January of 2015 at the Palestinian request to open a preliminary examination of the situation in, quote, Palestine. And on uh, December 20th, 2019, there's a lot of other things on her plate as chief prosecutor, but they took their time, uh, and, you know, were fed information, uh, all sort of, uh, you know, the Palestinians were really able to lobby and, and get the information in. Ben Suda announced December of 2019 that there was a reasonable basis for opening an investigation into the situation in Palestine. Uh, January 20th, uh, this would have been about a year ago, uh, a pretrial panel of judges rejected uh, the chief prosecutor's initial request to uh, examine this issue uh, based on a, a technical issue. Her, her 110 page brief was too long. <laughs> And they told her to whittle it down some uh, within a couple months, April 30th, 2020. She had uh, resubmitted it as only 60 pages. They said, OK, and uh, have been proceeding from there. Just uh, 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 within a month, uh, the ICC um, ha had asked uh, the Palestinian Authority for a clarification on PA President Mahmoud Abbas's statement that the Palestinian Authority would no longer be bound by or abide by the Oslo agreements. And they wanted to uh, clarify, of course, Abbas has said that many times, but this, this time he really meant it in the court uh, at this stage in the process said, can you clarify this for us? And you can see there's been this uh, you know, Israel's been on the sideline watching all this, but a direct dialogue with the Palestinian Authority over this whole probe, this whole effort. Uh, and on June 5th, the, the Palestinian Authority clarified that it regarded itself as absolved of all agreements with Israel, including Oslo, but it did not deem this to affect the case uh, that they were trying to build before the court. A few days later, June 8th, uh, the chief prosecutor, Ben Suda, agreed that Mahmoud Abbas's declaration uh, about not being bound by Oslo, it had no influence on the status of Palestine as a member of the Rome Statute, so they could proceed. And then on February 5th, just a couple of weeks ago, this pretrial panel of judges ruled that the ICC did, in fact, have jurisdictional authority over the territories uh, occupied in 67, including Gaza, West Bank, East Jerusalem. And this is where we are today. But you see that steady um, uh, dialogue between the ICC and the Palestinians that have led us to this moment. And today we're trying to get a little more knowledge back now, background, what are the weaknesses in the Palestinian case? How can we help? But it's it's really uh, outrageous for us that once again, the uh, uh, laws and norms, Geneva Conventions, other things set up after World War II to try and deal with some of the atrocities committed against the Jews uh, in the Holocaust, that it, they are now being used as a, a club against the Jewish state. And we wanna be clear that war crimes, and crimes against humanity, uh, genocide, these are especially heinous violations of law and moral decency. In fact, they're so bad, so odious, that uh, there are no statute of limitations for uh, prosecuting them. And thus, we have seen in modern times uh, Nazi war criminals hunted down to their grave by uh, the Simon Wiesenthal Center and others for a decade. I live in a neighborhood here in Jerusalem where I see um, uh, my friend uh, Ephraim Zuroff every day going to prayer at synagogue. And he's considered like the last uh, 
Nazi hunter, one of the last ones, and he's still 70 some years later trying to find some of these guys. But when you're talking about war crimes, crimes against humanity, they're so bad that there should be no limit on how long you can hunt these people down. And, but now the ICC would have us accept this perverse moral equivalence between what the Nazis did in forcefully transporting millions of Jews to their deaths and the voluntary return of Jews to the heart of their ancient biblical homeland, including Jerusalem. It's unacceptable in our view. And over uh, coming months, uh, the IC, ICEJ is gonna work with Israeli authorities, with other respected organizations, with our global uh, network and family of branches and activists around the world to oppose this and get uh, our nations to reject and rescind this outrageous decision. Thank you and thank you to our guest panelists for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for this clear presentation. And uh, it, it is indeed a perversion and it just uh, satisfies one clear pattern when it comes to anti-Semitism in history. Whenever the international community considers something as the most heinous crime and genocide would uh, fulfill this criterion, then inevitably anti-Semite ascribe these most horrible crimes to the Jews. And this is what we are seeing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the only Jewish state applied by uh, bodies like the ICC. Before we give the floor to hear Israel's point of view, I would just uh, like to recognize a few panelists who are among us. I can see Dr. Jacques Gauthier from Canada, respected lawyer, and uh, one that has uh, taken stand for Israel many times. It's great to have you, Doctor, and you will have opportunity to, to join later with your comments. And I would also like to recognize Mr. Christoph Scharnweber from Germany, uh, our top uh, activist, uh, in the country of Germany, one of those seven countries which actually filed a clear statement to the pretrial chamber, which was later ignored, but is one of the state parties which shares the view which is being expressed today. Mr. Andrew Tucker, who is a lawyer originally from Australia, he now lives in the Netherlands. He is an attorney specializing in international law and a respected Christian advocate for Israel. He uh, uh, speaks on behalf of a, a Christian think tank called THINK, uh, which is an abbreviation for the Hague Initiative for International Cooperation. It is an organization dedicated to the promotion of the rule of law in international relations. And uh, their focus is clearly the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. And as has been said, Andrew is very well uh, uh, informed about the whole case. So I would ask you, Andrew, to take the floor and give us your insights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moimir. Thank you, David. Thank you, Amit. And uh, for, for taking initiative to organize this uh, event and thank everybody for, for participating. I think it is extremely important uh, and very valuable that those of you in different countries around the world really grapple with, with what is going on here. Um, I fully agree with the previous speakers that this is a fundamentally important decision. Uh, we've seen a lot of things over the last couple of decades, uh, and there's always those critical points in history, aren't there, where, where major decisions are taken, and I believe uh, this is one of them. Um, I'd like to just take a, a little bit of a step back, if, if you like, and think about some of the bigger issues that are, that are raised by the decision. Uh, I think David and Amit have explained extremely well what was decided. And I think the key legal uh, issues that are raised. Um, first of all, you know, I think the fact that this took a year for the courts to come out with this ruling uh, is, is in itself significant. Uh, and as Amit mentioned, it's a ruling by two of the three judges. Um, and there's a very significant and substantive minority opinion being issued by the Hungarian judge, Peter Kovac, uh, which uh, is, raises a whole bunch of issues. And I think many of them offer uh, interesting, not only lines of argument, but I think fundamental positions which 
we can use later as we think about um, how to raise arguments about this and to whom can we raise those arguments. Um, there, there are three, I think, levels at which we can sort of think about this decision, uh, and I'll touch on a number of them. Uh, one is the, you know, the very technical legal analysis of the decision. Was it a right or was it wrong? Did they get the analysis of Article 12.3 of the Rome Statute right? We can have arguments about that. I think they got it fundamentally wrong um, by, by deciding that when the Rome Statute talks about a state, it simply means a state party. And in their view, any entity that accedes to the Rome Statute becomes a state party and therefore is a state in the terms of the statute. I think there's an illogical reasoning there uh, at a technical level. There's secondly, there's a more strategic level uh, to this decision, uh, which I think is the level we probably need to think about. And there's also some very fundamental conceptual issues. Now, I've got five points just to touch on and I think will help us uh, perhaps a little bit. First of all, this whole issue of, of statehoods. Now, really what you have, and I think you see it very much in the majority uh, as opposed to the minority view, the majority is a French judge and an African judge um, taking a view about uh, statehood, they say, we don't need to look at the issue of international law. We simply decide that if the General Assembly has decided this is a state, then that's good enough for us. And to be honest, I can understand this line of reasoning. If I were in the court, uh, I don't think I would want the court to be getting into this hot potato of whether this thing called Palestine is or is not a state. The court was confronted with, uh, I think, over 50 by leading international... I'm afraid we have some problems with the connection. Let's hope that Andrew comes back soon. His line is not working at the moment. Yes. Right, mm -hmm. Andrew, I think that we, uh, we lost you, but I yeah. see you're back. So we give the floor back to you. And please continue with uh, your presentation. Okay, thank you so much. I'm terribly sorry about that. Um, so the point I'm making is actually about this, these, these mindsets. And the, this point I think we need to stress is we have two very fundamental worldviews going on here. There, there's the worldview of the international criminal arena that, um, and, and we see this in the judgment where the court says, the purpose of the Rome Statute is to end impunity for international crimes. If we think there's a crime out there, then we will interpret the statute in such a way that we can tackle that crime. The prosecutor thinks there are crimes being committed by Israelis and Palestinians. Therefore, um, the court says we interpret the statute in such a way that we, that we give ourselves jurisdiction. And I think this reflects the, the this very dominant uh, line of thinking in international legal world uh, of the international criminal lawyers and international criminal law and human rights law has become the fundamental paradigm today through which uh, the lens through which people look at the world. And unfortunately, they see Israel as being the perpetrator and the Palestinians as the victim. Um, and, and this is the most difficult paradigm we have, I think, to change, to bring in the sense that the world is not made up of perpetrators and victims. This is a complex dispute. The Middle East is complex. This dispute is complex. And it's about two peoples uh, having different perspectives, fighting or arguing about uh, a piece of land and authority and sovereignty and so forth. Um, so these two worldviews, I think, uh, are problematic. Um, and one of the things that I think that is important to be argued is the case that the minority judge Kovac does. He says sovereignty is important, statehood is important, and the responsibility of states, not only uh, their accountability, but also the responsibility of states is important. And that, that is the reason that he goes 
right into the question of whether or not Palestine is a state or not. That leads to my second point is that the court uh, really simply ignores the position of Israel. It says this is just a dispute between Israel and the Palestinians about borders. And their reasoning is that our decision does not affect that dispute because we're not making a decision about borders. Therefore, we're not interfering with the sovereignty of Israel. Now, I think that's fundamentally wrong because uh, necessarily this decision, uh, if not directly, then indirectly, it's going to have a normative influence and effect on people they will see uh, and they will be confirmed in their perspective that Israel's uh, legitimacy is limited to the so-called 1967 lines uh, which for many reasons is fundamentally uh, wrong so at that level I think the court uh, has got this uh, wrong and there's a there's a real issue here about undermining Israel's right to territorial uh, sovereignty, its right to equality uh, in the international legal order. Uh, I think thirdly, perhaps most fundamentally, is the question about how we look at the territories. Uh, and, and I believe this is the, the core as well of, of, of this uh, decision. It's about how we frame the, the way we look at the territories. And again, the court sees these territories, everything outside the Green Line, as effectively belonging to the Palestinians. Uh, they say Palestine may not be a state fully, according to international law. Nevertheless, uh, implicitly, the Palestinians have a right to statehood over all of those uh, territories. Um, now, this, I, I think, is also a fundamentally incorrect uh, framing of the issues. Unfortunately, it is the majority view out there in the international legal world. Uh, most international lawyers, and we saw it when the annexation issue uh, flared up in the middle of last year, you know, hundreds of prominent international lawyers putting up their hand and saying Israel has no rights to sovereignty outside the, uh, outside the Green Line. Um, now the judge Kovach, the minority judge, uh, takes a different view and he says, this is the reason why he says the Oslo agreements are so important because they reflect the fact that these are disputed territories. Uh, Israel's sovereignty and the sovereignty of the territories has not been determined. No international tribunal, not even the International Court of Justice has made a determination about where sovereignty lies. This is the view that Israel has put and tried to put strongly, and I believe other states need to confirm that, that sovereignty is still to be determined over these territories. And the reason the Oslo Accords are so important, and one of the reasons, is that it creates a process for that fundamental issue amongst others uh, to be determined. And the only way it can be determined is through the negotiating process of uh, the parties. Um, which leads to, I think, an issue about negotiations. Um, I think a lot of work needs to be done still to explain why negotiations are so important and necessary, also legally speaking. Uh, I don't believe this has necessarily been uh, explained or understood well enough, Israel's position, and in fact the international community's position is that the only way that Palestinian statehood can be achieved is through negotiations. Now, if, if, that's, if that's true, if negotiations are required under international law, then that means that both parties, Israel and the Palestinians, need to be respected in their positions and not be and, and parameters not imposed upon them, which is effectively what this kind of decision is doing. So uh, I believe going forward, uh, one of the discussions that needs to be had is about why negotiation is important. And one of the reasons it is important is because sovereignty uh, has not been determined, um, at least as far as the West Bank is concerned, outside Jerusalem. Let me move just to 
uh, to the point then of settlements, and this raises the issue of Jerusalem as well, um, th there are two kinds of war crimes that the prosecutor believes uh, that have been committed. One of the war crimes related to the Gaza conflicts since 2014, uh, the court potentially has um, uh, the right to investigate those crimes by Israelis and according to the prosecutor, Hamas leaders as well. Uh, the other set of crimes relates to settlements, or so-called settlements. Uh, she believes that these settlements are illegal, or at least Israeli policy to enable the settlements to be created is a war crime. Uh, the fact that she believes that is used by the court to justify granting itself jurisdiction. Um, now, we have to realize settlements um, is one of the provisions of the Rome Statute. It comes from the Fourth Geneva Convention. Uh, it's the crime of deporting or transferring uh, the population of the occupying power into the occupied territories. This provision has never been the subject of any proceedings anywhere in the world. The court is getting itself into an area here uh, which is not only legally but factually extremely complicated, has never been the subject of international proceedings. Um, the, but I believe this is really what the prosecutor uh, wants to get her hands onto and which she sees as being perhaps even the most fundamental war crime in her view. Um, there is a distinction to be made between Jerusalem or so-called East Jerusalem and the West Bank. The reason being that Israel has clearly asserted its sovereignty over East Jerusalem since 1967. The international community has never accepted that. Um, but Israel has a much stronger position there to say that, that it has sovereignty over East Jerusalem. I think that needs to be argued and needs to be articulated um, because it has control and it is clearly through its application of Israeli law and jurisdiction to East Jerusalem asserted its sovereign rights. The West Bank is more complicated because Israel has not taken that position. Therefore, it is going to be more difficult for Israel or others to claim uh, that these are not uh, occupied territories or that the settlements are somehow uh, illegal. The court will have to, if it moves down this line, uh, explain the elements of the crime, which I say are legally complex, and there will be an enormous factual issues about proving that specific settlements have involved deporting or transporting, uh, transferring Israeli civilians into the territories. As we know, uh, all Israelis living there are doing so voluntarily. They've not been forced by the state of Israel or anybody else to, to live there. So there's a whole bunch of issues there, which I think the court uh, is going to have difficulties. Uh, this leads me to my final point. That is really going forward. Um, the question now is what will the prosecutor do. We have a new prosecutor who will come in in June. It's the British uh, international criminal lawyer, Karim Khan. He um, is, a, is a leading light in international criminal law. He has his own persona. He has his own view of things. He will take a fresh look at this. One of the, reason, one of the issues that will be discussed is whether this decision means that the prosecutor is obliged to proceed with an investigation. Uh, I don't believe so. I think this prosecutor will have the discretion to decide. The court is under enormous pressure. Again, an important point, I think, to realise the court has failed fundamentally in its mandate over the last 20 years. Uh, many states are dissatisfied with the courts. The state's parties have subjected it to a review. So this new prosecutor will be under a lot of pressure to settle priorities. And I think the argument needs to be made that this, certainly the settlement issue, um, is not an area that the court should be getting itself into. There are much more fundamentally uh, problematic war crimes that the court should be dealing with. My final point is I think the state parties, uh, one of the points the court made was it's the state parties who accepted Palestine into the UN as a non-member state. 
It's the uh, ICC state parties which accepted its accession to the ICC. And there's an implicit criticism of the state parties. I think it's a justified one that really states are not if they don't believe Palestine is a state, then they shouldn't be allowing Palestine to be getting to this position. And therefore, I think a discussion needs to be had within the assembly of state parties. Uh, and as we've seen, a number of states have already said they're not happy with what is happening. The pressure it's put on the prosecutor and potentially even the legal process from within the assembly of state parties to challenge the decision. So this is just the beginning, I think, of a very long road. And I think there are many opportunities for challenging what is a very problematic decision. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. We already have a few uh, panelists who would like to add the comments. Christoph Scharnweber from Germany would like to make a point. Christoph. Thank you very much also for organizing this meeting. I have a question concerning the role of the countries that now express that they do not agree, like uh, Germany did. I mean, the German uh, foreign policy originally declared that we fully trust the court, what will be done. Um, now they changed. We are very happy about this. They say uh, we do not agree. So this is really a miracle. And uh, the question is, uh, if now these so-called friends of courts, amicus curiae, are asked about their opinion, is this just something very polite? Everybody can express something, but things will go on as the court wants it. Or does it really has um, an influence? And the second question is, if the chief prosecutor is changing in June, um, then uh, can be done something pragmatically so that the whole trial and the, or the beginning of the trial can be postponed. I mean, whoever is a lawyer here in this uh, meeting understands that you can do a lot of things sometimes so that uh, the trial does not start and uh, a lot of uh, things are discussed uh, before. So uh, what would be uh, a pragmatic solution so that this trial against Israeli soldiers cannot start. I mean, we all can agree that we do not like what the ICC does, but this doesn't change a lot. So what can be really done and what can our countries done? Or is there something we can do in order to lobby in our countries uh, for that case? Thank you, Christoph. Very relevant. Uh, I would feel the question to Andrew. Probably. Thank you. Uh, thank yeah. you. A very, very good question. The, the first question about the, the friends of the court. Um, the, uh, when the court invited, oh, opened up for, for uh, people to make submissions, they gave the opportunity to states and to, to others. Now, um, it was, as Amit says, uh, quite remarkable that seven states made a submission um, and they are all also uh, state parties. So they have a very different position. I think uh, this is really where the focus should be now. The academics uh, or the NGOs that made submissions, the court has really basically ignored them. Uh, well, they haven't ignored them. They've, they've, they've adopted the view of, of half of them. And, and they've failed to fundamentally engage with the, with the arguments of the others, which were good arguments. They were some, substantive arguments, but the court really has ignored them. And there's no process for them now to get back involved in the decision. So therefore, I think the opportunity is for the state parties like Germany, like Austria, Hungary, uh, the Czech Republic, uh, also uh, Australia, uh, Brazil, Uganda. These are the states um, which I think need to be lobbied, I think, uh, in a positive sense and they need to be encouraged to be taking a, a, a proactive view and, and getting other states around them to, I think, challenge uh, the decision and uh, convince the new prosecutor, um, because as has been said, uh, he has to establish the new priorities uh, and, and to convince him that certainly going down this, uh, this route is not going to be a, a helpful way of, of proceeding. Thank you, Andrew. So 
uh, if I may just uh, repeat that, we do have, or the, the state parties do have a legal way that they can do, and uh, we have representatives in those countries, so we can do well to, to lobby them and to make our voices uh, heard. Uh, then uh, we also have probably a, another way to, to make our uh, voices heard uh, in a more general sense. And uh, I have heard a lot of uh, questions here about uh, what can we do to, to educate uh, our people and to give them a possibility to, uh, to join a campaign or something. So this is uh, one of the things that we are considering. We'll come uh, later to it. And this is something that uh, we can invite all of you to take part in. Before doing so, I have an, another question uh, from our Finnish representative, Yanni Salokangas. Yanni, would you please ask your question? Yes. Thank you so much uh, for the panelists. It's been very informative. Also for a lot of people who are not very aware on, on, the, on the basics of this issue. I just have a question um, regarding the, the interpretation of international law and the, the boundaries of the international law because as I understand right now, the ICC is uh, stretching its uh, jurisdiction over um, over areas that actually has no jurisdiction over. Um, because looking at um, the situation, for example, in Cyprus and Turkey, uh, Cyprus is a member of the ICC and Turkey is not a member state. So looking at this case, uh, I would say that the ICC has uh, a, a much stronger a much uh, stronger case to actually rule against Turkey and, and put people of the Turkish regime under uh, international uh, law. So my question is, what does this do actually to the value of international law when the actual entity who is supposed to be working inside of the, the international law is not really valuing the law that they're supposed to be representing? Question on international law. I think I would ask Andrew again, uh, being an expert in that area. Sorry, it's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, the problem is international law is, uh, in a sense, what 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 you make of it. Uh, a lot of people are actually saying this is actually a very, a very good development of international law. Uh, the international community should be accepting uh, less than state parties. There's a very strong line of thinking out there that um, we should get away from sovereign states and we should be opening up the international community to entities like Palestine, which are less than states. So they would see this as being an affirmation of international law. So really it's a discussion between two different views of of international law and I think our job is to you know articulate the, the reasons why states are important and why uh, a traditional conservative view of statehood is is important and that it underlies the ICC which has no power no jurisdiction no authority to do anything except that states give to it uh, and that's an argument that needs to be um, made very strongly. So I agree there's a very big difference between the Cyprus case and this case for the very reason Palestine here is, you know, universally understood not to be a state yet. It aspires to be a state. Everybody wants it to be a state, apparently. A lot of people do, but it's not one yet. And uh, we, we need to uh, articulate why that's important. More mere. <laughs> I would um, I would add there, there's an old adage in the legal profession that uh, bad cases make bad law, and I think this has been a truth uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for decades. That the way uh, the anti-Israel uh, elements out there have tried to bend and shape and manipulate international law to put Israel in the DACA time after time after time. It's actually undermined uh, universal human rights laws, universal criminal laws, and all of these things in a way that is very unfortunate for the whole world community. <clears throat> yeah. 
May I add one more uh, point? Sure. I think that uh, the answer is, is, is actually simple uh, to this question because this decision of the court distorts, completely distorts international law. And um, as was said by Andrew, the court can judge only country states that are member of the uh, Rome Convention and um, Israel is not a party to the ICC and it has not consented to its jurisdiction. Only sovereign states can delegate jurisdiction to this court. And uh, there is no Palestinian state. And thus, with this ruling, this court becomes a political tool and not a, a, any form of institution that makes justice. And I want to add one more thing and to say that um, last week, um, in our synagogues, we read in the Torah, the Torah portion of um, Mishpatim. It's called it's Exodus 21 to 24, and this uh, this Torah portion begins with the words of God that were directed to Moses. These are the Mishpatim. These are the laws that you shall set before them, and basically this is the uh, continuation of the Ten Commandments. And when you look at the uh, operation of this court, you see that justice and, and this, you know, the, the ruling of this court um, are completely apart. There's no justice. It is only a political tool. And thus it completely distorts international law. One more thing that has to be said again is that this court was established in order to confront mass atrocities that really deeply, deeply shock the conscience of the entire humanity. And it was not, uh, it was not established in order to pursue uh, democratic states that are completely committed to the rule of law. So this is my two cents. Excellent, Excellent Sharon. Um, well, we are coming to a close of our session, and I think there's a universal agreement among us uh, uh, that uh, the decision of the law of the ICC is deeply flawed. Um, now the question needs to be said, what can we do about it? What can we do? We are here representing um, a global network of activists, some of our uh, lawyers, some of us are lawyers, some of us are uh, people who have access to politicians. So what courses of action uh, can be considered uh, in order to try and prevent, the, first of all, the investigation or what kind of influence can the public have, in fact, uh, or through the member states? Or what is the possibility that uh, we could possibly do? Anyone? I think the time has, may I? I think the time has come where we need to really up the game when it comes to the public relations, because Israel has been standing on international law since 1948 and people aren't listening. Too many people aren't listening. Um, when you look at the reputation of these organizations like the United Nations, like the International Court, um, it, it's deplorable. And perhaps it's time to, for each one of us that's here, to start talking to, ministering, um, being able to get out the message to our, our, our sphere of influence and taking it very seriously and taking it to the next level to educate people so that Israel is given a fair shake when it comes to um, information, um, public relations. The, the, the slanderous, the slander against Israel is why we're here today. The other side, the entire Palestinian Jihad, they're not standing on anything solid. And the Palestinian Authority keeps boasting, even on PATV, for children to see that the Palestinian culture is one of martyrdom. And the Israel needs to become, I think, people, all of us, more engaged in that kind of an activism when it comes to truth, recognizing that it's Israel, but it's also all democratic nations, because Israel is really the only democracy in the Middle East. Thank you. Moimir, can I make a suggestion, Moimir? Yes, please. Um, as you know, our, our turf is the international law, but, but 
is now an urgent matter and it has been uh, said by several speakers, there may be a window of opportunity where we as individuals living in the democracies we live in have access to the representatives in parliament and in the government, be it opposition or be it in the coalition, but we should talk to our representatives in the parliaments and say what the ICC is doing is not according to its original charter. This is not what, why it was established. And now it's moving, taking political decisions and going in the wrong direction. And uh, we don't have to be uh, emotional about it, but it is not in the interest of our democracies and the ICC itself if it continues on this path. So maybe next week when we have the next uh, edition of the conference, we can phrase some actions that will enable the audience to take action in their countries. Yes, Peter, exactly. I believe that uh, there are basically two avenues which uh, seem to be available to us. One is to present our elected officials, our governments with uh, clear cut arguments. This is where our lawyers can help us formulate and give argumentation uh, with which we can you know, address these people and uh, try uh, to convince them to exert their influence within their sphere uh, of influence towards the ICC. And the other thing that I can see, uh, there is a widespread call for education. And this is, I believe, the role of the ICJ with our global network of activists. And uh, we have uh, already considered uh, perhaps starting a global petition which uh, would activate people. And in the wake of that petition, we would also provide some basic information which could be shared and with which people could educate their communities, their churches, the leaders and so forth. So this seems to be the two uh, two paths that we can take simultaneously uh, using the body of arguments in these two way political and uh, let's say social or, or global. And uh, we are going to do our homework and uh, bring uh, some concrete proposals to you next week. So stay tuned uh, with us and also you can talk to your friends and uh, people who could make a difference in this matter and invite them to join us next week. I will give the final uh, floor to David if he would like to wrap up the discussion today. Yes, we want to uh, invite everyone to come back uh, during this same time slot next Thursday for part two of this webinar series on the ICC ruling where we're going to talk about uh, what we can do uh, uh, in, within our own countries and uh, together as a worldwide movement, uh, t uh, teaming up with other organizations. We have a whole new set of panelists uh, to do this, but uh, this was an educational background context, very good uh, presentations by uh, fellow panelists. We wanna thank you all again. And next week we're gonna talk about uh, call to action, what we can be doing. And, uh, and try and have some materials ready at that time for people to, to equip them and, and mobilize them in this battle. Eh? It's a case of the enemy isn't sleeping and we, we have to, uh, to uh, stay at the wheel ourselves, uh, our hands to the, um, to the plow but we have a, a God who ne neither slumbers nor sleep who watches over Israel. So we don't have to fret about it, but we have to do our moral duty towards Israel and the Jewish people and state in defending them from things that uh, Christians used to do to them and that are you know, now considered atrocities and, and criminal offenses. And we know Israel does not belong in that category now. Okay. Yes. Thank you, David. Uh, once again, thank you all our panelists, uh, Amit, Andrew, and David. Thank you for to all of you who participated actively. Thank you. We had almost 128 participants at the height of the session. Uh, just for your information, it has been recorded. It will be available on YouTube and I believe also on Facebook. So you have this recording also available to you later on. And uh, again, uh, if you have any particular uh, specific points uh, you can send it to us in the meantime and uh, next week on Thursday we're going to present uh, some specific proposals 
hopefully we can move the thing forward uh, uh, in our common efforts. So thank you very much. God bless you. See you next week.